also mentioned the capture of the former Iraq. 100,000 people were marching through central London to protest against both plans for a war on Iraq and to demand justice in Palestine. What about a regime change in Baghdad? I'm beginning to think we need a regime change right here in Washington, D.C. <laughs> My dear Muslim brothers and sisters in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. To our respected guests, and to all of those individuals who have yet to, to understand and to consider the great system of Islam, we say, Peace be upon those who follow the guidance. To my dear brothers and sisters and our respected guests and sincere seekers after truth, I want to thank the organizers of this event, One Islam, Islamic Media Studios, the Global Islamic Youth Center, and the other supporters. And most of all, I want to thank the Most High for providing all of us with the gift of life, which without it, no one would be here. I understand that it is my responsibility and challenge to offer a proposition on the true success of life. And in doing so, I want to highlight the principle that God must necessarily exist. And also, after highlighting the proposition that God must necessarily exist, then what is his message to his creatures? Now that theme, we have to connect it to the greater proposition, what is the true success in life? So keep that in mind as we proceed. Now I am prepared to discharge my responsibility to offer a proposition this evening. However, you 
as an audience also have a responsibility. And your responsibility is to be reasonably open-minded and open-hearted. Open-minded and open-hearted in your consideration of my proposition. Now you would agree, all of us would agree, that if a glass were turned upside down, it could not be filled. Therefore, each of us should turn the glass of our consciousness, the glass of our mental disposition, right side up. In a world filled with prejudice and preconditioning, it is sometimes very difficult to accept things or ideas that we had not been previously exposed to or from persons that we have generally been alienated from. Tonight, I want you to relax, chill, open your mind, open your heart, to the idea of success. Ask yourself, what is real success? Who would I be if I were successful? And what would I have if I were successful? Ask yourself, do I know any successful people? What is the meaning of success? How do we measure success? Who and what are our role models for success? I asked myself those questions and I asked others I came in contact with throughout my life. And I arrived at the same general conclusions as most people. Conclusions produced by education, social exposure, the impact of media, and then by my own personal aspirations and impressions about life. For instance, when I read the definition of success in the Oxford University Press, when I considered that, I want to share that with you. This is what the Oxford University Press, this is what they say that success means. Success is the accomplishment of aims and purposes. Success is the attainment of fame, wealth, and social status. Now that's what Oxford University Press, that's what they say that success is. Now I want to ask all of you here, because I want to make sure that all of us are in sync. Are all of you seeking happiness and success in life? Can I get a show of hands that everybody who would like to have happiness and success in life? Nearly everybody wants happiness and success. Some people not so sure. Would you like to have tranquility, self-contentment, confidence, peace, security? Would you like to have that? 
If so, welcome to the club. Everyone in the world, in one way or the other, when they're asked about success or happiness, this is what they say, this is what they want. This is what we have been striving for all of our lives, kicking and scraping and hoping and wishing and fighting and cheating and lying and stealing and conniving and everything that we're trying to do, somehow or another, we're relating it to, inevitably, success. Believers and disbelievers, the righteous and the evildoers, every single one of them is after happiness and success. Even when you ask someone down the street or up the street, getting high, as they call it, if you ask them why they're taking drugs, why they're drinking, why they're fornicating, committing adultery, if you ask them why, inevitably they're going to tell you, it makes me feel good, at least for a moment. It doesn't matter what the results, what the final results are, just so long as somehow or another there's a click in our minds that it somehow relates to even temporary happiness or success. Unfortunately, most people take the wrong path towards happiness and success. Although everyone is after happiness, the masses of people, like animals, take the wrong path. And it is only a handful of people that take the time to think and to reflect and to seek inspiration to determine the correct path towards happiness. Now, I was always led to believe that if I had a good education, that that would guarantee a good job and subsequently good status in society. That's what I was told. This led me to conclude that those persons with the highest levels of education, such as doctors, lawyers, architects, etc., they must prospectively be the most successful people in life. Then I realized That in fact, these persons who I thought, whom I would consider to be the most successful people in life, the doctors, the lawyers, the architects, the film stars, the athletes, the musicians, the gangsters, and the criminals, as a matter of fact, I realized that these people possessed with education or not. These people holding the acquisition of things in their hands, all the toys of life. These people holding in their hands the influence of the masses of people all over the world. These people having the highest standard of worldly attainment. Of course, to most of us, this itself should somewhat signify a semblance of success. But let us see to what extent. In fact, statistics indicate that the greatest number of suicides, divorces,
personal tragedy exists among the rich and the famous. In spite of their perceived status, they are lonely, most of them, and they die lonely, most of them. They are frustrated, most of them, and they die frustrated. Most of them are addicted to drugs, alcohol, and other things. Most of them are experiencing many psychological disorders, unable to retain simple relationships, hardly knowing who their real friends are, and usually dying pathetic and alone. Now these are what you and I would, and most people would consider to be the most successful human beings in the world. Let me share with you a statistic from the World Health Organization. Did you know that suicide is among the three leading causes of death in the Western developed world? I said the Western developed world, where the semblance and the trappings of success are the most preeminent. The World Health Organization estimated that in the year 2000, approximately one million people, that is, in the Western Hemisphere, would have died from suicide. That means 16 people out of every 1,000 people choose to take their own lives while it would appear that they are living among a civilization that has the highest standard of living. So why are 16 out of 1,000 people taking their own lives? Feeling to themselves meeting a point in their lives where they cannot see any value in living. That's tragic. That's pathetic. That's a profound statistic. This means 16 people out of 100,000, that means there is one death every 40 seconds. Every 40 seconds, a person in the Western Hemisphere is cutting their throat, jumping off a bridge, taking some pills, cutting their wrists, blowing their brains out, or doing something else to end their life. And these are the most educated people in the world. The World Health Organization further states that in the last 45 years, suicide rates have increased 60% worldwide. That means the more sophisticated and the more educated that we become, the more inclined we are to take our lives or to take someone else's. Now, one may think or one would think to themselves that when we consider the poverty, the disease, the social destabilization in the so-called undeveloped countries, we would think that those people in those countries would be committing suicide, but that is not the case. Those people seem to be able to deal with their situations, but they're not educated and they're not sophisticated. As a matter of fact, in the poverty-stricken countries that have the lowest living standard, statistics actually reveal that they have the lowest rate of suicide. As a matter of fact, in the countries where people are considered to be heathens, terrorists, fanatics, extremists, 
inhuman. The only suicide that is done in those countries is people who call themselves or who are called suicide bombers. And then we find out that they themselves didn't call themselves suicide bombers. They called themselves martyrs. As a matter of fact, in the Muslim world in particular, and I'm proud of this statistic, the rate of suicide in the Muslim countries is less than 0.5% out of 100,000. Because for most Muslims, and I would almost venture to say, almost every Muslim, suicide is never, ever an option. Because from the very beginning, we understand that life doesn't belong to us. And we understand that success is not in the things that you possess or what other people think of you. But success is in gratitude. Success is in acknowledgement. Success is in the contentment of knowing who you are, why you're here, and what your purpose in life is. And if a person begins by having this acknowledgement and throughout their life they are cultivating this acknowledgement then they're never inclined towards despair and they're never inclined towards suicide I ask you brothers and sisters here do the things that people acquire give them satisfaction and peace of mind does the influence over people grant them contentment and fulfillment? The answer is emphatically no. Kings, queens, rulers, and heads of states all have possessions. All of them have power over their subjects and their citizens, but they do not lead lives of contentment, satisfaction, peace of mind, and fulfillment. On the contrary, their lives are a combination of daily stress, struggle to maintain their status, preoccupation and anticipation of war inside their countries or outside their countries, paranoia and anxiety over their competitors and their opponents. Hardly any one of them Throughout history, hardly any one of the kings, the queens, the rulers, the heads of states, hardly any one of them throughout history has left a legacy or a conduct as a role model and a human evidence of success. We only have to turn to the lives of the rich and famous in the past in the present and see that they do not give us an inspiration towards success. I ask you, why is it that things and status do not grant us success or satisfaction as the Oxford University Press seems to give the definition of? It is because the human being has five parts to his or her existence. And each part of our existence must be given adequate nourishment. It must be given adequate development for satisfaction and for balance. The human being has five parts to their being, you and I. The human being has a soul. The soul is the spirit, the essence, the unseen part of the human being that seeks out abstract values. The soul is that part of the human being that has the need for worship, inner sanctity, 
that strives to understand and to reach out to embrace the purpose of life, the soul. The human being has a mind. Unlike other animals that are more powerful than we are, it is our mind, it is the human mind that gives them the superiority among other creatures. For if it were not for our minds, elephants would put us in zoos. Lions and tigers and baboons would put us in zoos because they are more powerful than we are, but they cannot think and they cannot calculate and they cannot manipulate because we have been given intelligence. The mind of the human being is the source of intelligence, always seeking to know, to acquire the means to compute, to communicate, to extend through the mind and to dominate through the mind and also always seeking answers, always seeking to perceive. Then there's the heart. A wise man, a man of scripture, a man of guidance, a prophet and a messenger of Almighty God, he said to us about the heart, Verily, there's a piece of flesh in the body. When it is sound and clean, the whole body is sound and clean. When it is corrupted, the whole body is corrupted. Verily, that piece of flesh is the heart. The heart. The organ of love, emotion, and passion. The heart, where feelings generate, where principles of loyalty, friendship, commitment, and sacrifice, all of that emanates from the heart. And then there's the self. Oh, all of us know about the self. The ego, the me, the I, the my, the realization of self, self-aggrandizement, self-serving, the source of all wanting to possess always wanting to possess everything, everybody, everywhere, the self. The self is what overflows through greed, through avarice, through envy and jealousy, all the way until disease and death. The self always trying to fulfill itself and not caring about any other self. And finally, the lowest form of the human being that most humans seem to never evolve beyond, and that is the body. The body. The body that eats and drinks and sleeps, that smells and tastes, sees, hears, touches. The body that houses the whole person, but cannot fulfill the other components. The body can never fulfill the soul. The body can never fulfill the mind. The body can never fulfill the heart's desires. The body can never contain the self. The body only houses the rest of the person. But most of us, we live all of our lives only feeding the body. The body is the lowest form of the person, but is perceived by most to be the most critical and the most valuable. 
And this is why the hedonists, the materialists, and the pleasure seekers, they can never seem to arrive at anything more than the satisfaction of the body. And that's why everybody seems to live for Friday night. They work like dogs, like animals, stealing, scheming, doing everything. Working their hearts out, working double jobs to own a car, a house, to buy clothes, to go to fancy restaurants, to lay down with an ugly or a pretty woman or a bald-headed or a crippled man. Doesn't matter. Just lay down with something or someone. The body. And we go through life from Friday to Friday. Friday to Friday until the year is out. And another year is out. And the next thing we know, we have lived 50 or 60 years of that kind of living. And what do we have? Absolutely nothing that resembles happiness or success. The human being, unlike other animals, is in need of enlightenment. The human being is in need of inspiration. The human being is in need of guidance. The human being is in need of spiritual awareness. The body is like a vehicle that houses the passengers and protects them from the elements and delivers them to their intended destination. The self is like the driver who holds the wheel and makes the determination to turn, to brake, to accelerate, or to stop. The mind is the navigator who reminds, who calculates about the distance, the fuel, the direction, the destination, the environment, and coordinates all the dynamics for the driver. The heart is the generator, the source of energy. The heart is what keeps all the passengers engaged, entertained, inspired. The heart is what keeps all the passengers of the body connected to their purpose of their journey. But the soul, the soul is the real purpose of the journey. The soul is always telling the other passengers about the real purpose of the journey. And sometimes we don't want to hear what the soul has to say. The soul is reminding us when we're young about containing our youth. We don't want to hear that. The soul is reminding us when we're old about our youth, but we don't want to hear that. The soul is reminding us when we are well, when we're healthy, when we're strong. The soul is reminding us to be grateful, but we don't want to hear that. When we're ill, when we're sick, the soul is reminding us of the health that we used to have, but we don't want to hear that. The soul is reminding us about death. While you're living, the soul is always knocking at the door and telling you and I that death is inevitable. Tomorrow, one morrow, one next day will be your day. The soul is telling us this, but we don't want to listen. The soul is the conscience, which reminds and drives the passengers. The soul is always irritating us, telling us about its origin, telling us about where it's going to wind up at, always trying to tell us to distinguish the difference between real and unreal. The soul is the supernatural self, which is connected to the unseen elements. The unseen elements of birth, 
the unseen elements of dreams, the unseen elements of vision, and inevitably, the unseen element of death. The soul is that which enters the body and becomes the person. At a certain point, when the child is conceived, it is at one point just a piece of flesh, or at one point it is just a sperm drop connected to an egg, just a clot. At another point, it becomes a fetus. At another point, it becomes an embryo. At a certain point, the soul enters and it becomes an actual person. And we are told that when a child is in the womb of the mother, at 14 weeks, it is a complete person. The heart is beating. Its fingerprints are there. Its mind, its brain is operating. Its little lungs are operating and breathing. All of its fingers and toes have been formed. And just by the way, just so that you know this figure, in the Western Hemisphere, that is, United States of America, Canada, the UK and Europe, and Australia, 2,300 little children, little people, are murdered every single day. It's called abortion. The easy way out. Can you imagine that? In an educated, sophisticated world bent upon success, they are murdering 2,350 little people every single day. Now you divide that by the hour. It means that more than 105 little babies are being slaughtered, aborted every hour. So by the time we finish sitting here, by the time we finish our lecture here in the Western Hemisphere, where people are sophisticated, wealthy, stable, educated, about 250 or 350 little people would have been murdered. But they call that abortion. We call that family planning, a real nice word. I don't know how you plan families by killing them. That's another subject that we really need to talk about because I don't know how women, how they live the rest of their lives knowing that they kill the average young lady in the West who is unprincipled, unbridled, unconnected, and without guidance. The average lady in the West, in the course of 20 years, she kills at least three. Now how she lives with that, behind all of her makeup and mascara, I don't know. But Helena Rubinstein and Max Factor, they came up with a formula for that. Do you know what it is? Well, they take those little babies that they kill, they liquidate them, and they put them into makeup, so now you can kill a baby and wear it on your face. That's economics. The soul is that which enters the body and becomes the person. And the soul 
is that which leaves the body. So that person is then pronounced dead. And that's when that person loses all their friends, loses all their family, loses all their wealth, and loses all their connection with the world that they worked for all their lives. And guess what? No matter how much that body was loved, in about two hours, the loved one's going to get that body out of the house. Because after the soul leaves, that body begins to smell. The soul is the record of you and I. The soul is that everlasting evidence of you and I. Dear brothers and sisters, bear with me. We're halfway through. True satisfaction and contentment can be realized only when the soul is nourished, only when the soul is stabilized. We know how we feel in the morning of an important occasion. When you have a test, when you have an important appointment, when you have that critical interview, the opening of a special project, you know how you feel. If you are well prepared, you feel rested and you feel confident. We emanate that confidence. We have the resonance of confidence. And everyone that's around us can feel it. On the other hand, if we're not prepared, or if we're tired, frustrated, and confused, we will not be confident. And we will also emanate that frustration and that lack of confidence to others. Human beings can only be successful if they seek the contentment and the satisfaction of the soul, which in turn will provide them with a healthy, well-balanced outlook on life. I said a healthy, well-balanced, optimistic outlook on life and a reasonable understanding of their own purpose, <clears throat> of their own purpose in life. Now, this purpose of life has many proofs and many indicators. This purpose in life has historical evidences and illustrations. Now such an important aspect of our lives is not without a manual. There has to be a manual for life, for everything that you and I possess, all the toys, all the sophisticated instruments that we use in our life, everything has a manual. If you buy a new watch, it comes with a manual. If you buy a new car, it comes with a manual. Thank you, brother. If you buy a new house, it comes with a manual. If you buy a new computer, it comes with a manual. If you get a new wife or husband, it comes with a manual. <laughs> Sometimes there's some hidden clauses, but it comes with a manual. Not only does 
all the things that, that we use in life come with a manual. Did I do something? <laughs> that comes with a manual too. <laughs> Not only do all the things that we use in life come with a manual, but we expect it. And not only do we expect a manual, but we look also for a warranty. And when we exercise this warranty or this guarantee, we call the company and we ask the company to send out a technician. So with everything that's valuable to us in life, we look for a manual. We look for a warranty. We look for a technician to explain to us or to work out the problem, to troubleshoot for us or to guide us through that situation. And we look always in life for human examples. We look for clear and irrefutable signs that tell us that we're on the right way. This is the right product. I made the right decision. We need to consider that life and whatever exists, I said that life and whatever exists must have a source, must have an origin. It must have a designer, an intelligence, which coordinates, maintains, determines, and ultimately controls. Something as simple as water. Something as simple as water has to have a source. And you and I, our beginning, part of our physical, biological beginning is water. Sperm is water. The human being, the composition of the body is water. Our atmosphere, our stratosphere, our environment is mostly made of water. That's the source. That's the origin and the Qur'an, a sacred scripture revealed almost 1,500 years ago, said, and verily, we have created every living thing from water. And although this scripture is not a book of science, that is a scientific fact. And now we have discovered that in a drop of water, all the elements of life are present in a drop of water. Something so simple. Either you got it or you don't. The most valuable element in life that has all the elements in it, that if you don't have it, you die. And if you do, you're blessed. Water. I say to you that even water has a source and even water has been designed. The microscopic biological breakdown of water has intelligence behind it. An intelligence that coordinates life to come from it that maintains life in it, that determines and ultimately controls the balance of life from which it comes. You and I would have to agree that that phenomena could not have come about by itself. It has to have an originator. It is the source of all living things in the world that we call existence. 
That supreme intelligence must be the source of all creation. That supreme intelligence must be the legislator, must be the sovereign, must be the ruler, and ultimately must be the judge. Call it God, call it the most high, call it the most merciful, call it the creator, call it the source, call it the power, call it the energy, call it what you want. That source is the benefactor, and you and I, and everything else that exists, we are the beneficiaries. And if we just consider ourselves as beneficiaries of this magnificent creation, we should be thankful, and we should be grateful for our lives, for the gifts of our senses, which we could not purchase and which we could not have otherwise obtained. So let me find out how many intelligent, endowed, sophisticated human beings that are here who want to say that they have created themselves. Does anybody want to take a stab at that? Anybody want to stand up and say, I created myself? I am self-endowed. I, I am my own benefactor as, and as, as well. I am the benefactor of all those who are here. Not the atheist, not the agnostic, not the communist, not the socialist. Not the Baptist, not the Catholic, not the Protestant, not the Muslim. Not the Buddhist, not the Hindu, not the male, not the female, not the old, nor the young, nor the, the rich or the poor. No one would say that. Because that would be the most absurd thing to say. And no one of us would be willing to give up any one of our senses in exchange for possessions. No one would give up their sense of smell for a hundred thousand pounds. No one would give up their sense of taste for a hundred thousand pounds or a million. No one would give up their sight to their mother or their daughter. No one would give up their sense of touch. No one would give their heart in exchange for some money. No one would give up their kidneys. Not both of them anyway. If each of us were offered employment with a new company, think about this for a minute. Think that this brother, he came here tonight representing this new company, just came out of America. Just let's uh, think about that for a minute. I just arrived here and I'm promoting this new company. It's called Live As You Like. That's the new company. Live as you like, and live as long as you want to, and have everything that you ever wanted in life working for my new company. And go on the stock market and look and see, you'll find out that our assets are in the billions. So everybody will feel comf comfortable that if you work for me, you're going to get paid. So let's see what the terms are. If each of us were offered employment with this new company, which had billions of dollars of assets, and that company had very basic employment requirements, it was prepared to hire everyone in this room tonight, right now, and your pay will begin as soon as you walk out, checks will be issued. Sounds like a good company, right? Let's talk about that company. What are the requirements? And what are the job expectations? One, we're paying a 
we're paying 1,000 pounds a week. That's the start. With bonuses, if you're good employees. One of the good things about that, this company is that you work at home. You don't have to get up and go to work. Isn't that beautiful? No taxes taken out of your pay. We take care of all of that for you. No direct supervision. It's an honor system. And only three or four employment policies and conditions. How many people here would think that so far this sounds like a pretty nice company? How many people think about that? I would. Sound like a pretty good company? You think there's a trick to it, right? There's no trick to it. Let me tell you what the conditions are. The conditions for employment in this company is to be clean, decent, and honest. That's the first thing you're going to be asked. Are you clean? Will you be clean? Will you be decent? Will you be honest? What would you say? What would you say? Yeah, you're damn right. That's what most of you would say. You'd say it just like that in your own mind. You wouldn't say that to the employer. You'd say that in your mind. Yeah, you're right. Of course I would be. At least, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm home. Of course I'm going to be clean. Of course I'm going to be decent. Of course I'm going to be honest. I got no direct supervision. I don't have to come, no, go nowhere. I don't have to get dressed. I don't have to get in a car. I don't have to be in, in traffic. And I got paid on the way out of the place with no job application. Of course I'll be clean, decent, and honest. And if I'm not, I'll learn how to be clean, decent, and honest. What's the second condition? The second condition is that you must read and understand the company manual. A very simple manual. And you must be willing to follow the company representative and comply with the basic behavior and ethics that shows your loyalty to the company. The company does not produce any products. So you don't have to wor worry about waking up, setting up, producing something, mailing something, packing something, nothing. No. The company just wants clean, decent, honest people that understand the company very well, that read the manual of the company so it can remind others about this company. That's the kind of people that we want to hire. The company wants, in return, for giving you all of these benefits. Oh, I didn't even tell you about the vacations. You get a 30-day paid vacation every 90 days. Hospital, education, housing, all paid for. And every time you have a baby, legitimately that is, you got to be a legitimate baby, you got to be legitimate baby makers now. <laughs> we add those on to the budget and you get more money. So how many people want to be married and have babies with that company? Huh. Let's keep talking about this company, it's a beautiful company. <laughs> now what this company wants its employer, its employees to do to show their gratitude, to show their loyalty. We want you to stop. Whatever it is that you're doing in the course of the day, because all you're really doing all day long is what? You're just relaxing. You're eating good food, you're spending that thousand pounds a week, you're relaxing, you're watching television, mowing the lawn, sitting out, drinking lemonade, waving at your neighbors, Everybody's stuck in traffic and you at home collecting money. 
Everybody's asking you what's going on. You tell them, man, you better get with this company. Now with all this relaxation, all these bonuses, and all these benefits that you're getting, what does the company want? The company wants you and I to stop several times a day, three, four, five times, to think about the benefactor of the company. Now you don't, ne you, you never see the benefactor. All you know is that he is the one. He's behind all of this. He's the one that signs the checks. He's the one that makes it happen. He's the one that gives you the comfort that you need. And so several times a day, the only thing we want you to do is to stop and think about the benefactor of this company. And then with a toll free card that we give you, we want you to dial a number and call up the company headquarters. You dial that number and call up the company headquarters and say, uh, this is Khalid, uh, I'm employee number 172, and I'm very grateful. Uh, I'm just calling in to check in and let you know that I'm thinking about the benefactor and about the company. I, I just love it. All my children love it. Uh, we, we added, we had some more children want to add to the budget. Uh, I love everything that's going on. And after calling in, it's recorded my gratitude, my loyalty, my commitment to the company is registered on a daily basis. Now, do you think that would be too much to ask? Tell me the truth. If there was such a company, would that be too much to ask for you to call in to show your gratitude, your continued commitment and loyalty to the company? to receive all these continued benefits. Also, the company wants you not only to be self-concerned, the company wants you to be a good neighbor. The company wants you to live in harmony with other people. The company wants you to set a good human example. The company wants you to establish good family ethics. The company wants you to show your neighbors how decent of a person that you are. The company wants you to interact at times with the other co-workers of the company, persons of all backgrounds. The company also wants you to be the kind of person that when people pass by your house and they ask you for something to drink, for something to eat, because they don't have a job like yours, the company wants you to be generous. The company wants you and I to sincerely work to realize and to bring into fruition peaceful coexistence with all human beings. And finally, the company wants you to prepare yourself to always remain prepared for an unexpected examination. That means that any time the company representative could come to check your house. The company representative will come at any time to check you, to check your accounts, to balance things. The company could come at any time and put your commitment on the line. Therefore, the company wants you to have things in order at all times. And that's what the company is spending this money, investing this in you, for you to be a model employee. The company wants you and I to prepare and expect a period of examination, a period of reconciliation, a balancing of accounts, of our performance and our behavior, in order to determine the renewal and the extension of our contract. If the benefactor is pleased, you'll get more bonuses. And even if you die, the most beautiful thing about this contract, that the benefactor 
is going to extend your life and make sure that the family that you leave behind that they are continued in the same status that you had now, isn't this a beautiful company isn't that a beautiful deal it takes care of you here and hereafter how many people would work for that company tell me the truth most of you no tricks to it no curve at the end of the road no other conditions involved well what I talk to you about is a metaphor a facsimile a proposition but in fact what I've talked to you about is a reality you have been given more than what I just spoke about you've been given more than that in fact none of you have yet paid rent on any of the houses that you have your body is the house that you were given your senses are the passengers in it and the furniture in it and let me see if any of you have paid rent on your house have you paid rent nobody has paid any rent but all the gifts that you've been given your life and your senses and your sight your gift of breathing your children and your homes your health your wealth your status You've been given all these things by a benefactor and you paid nothing for it. And it's all happening without your even asking for it. And yes, there will be an examination. And yes, there will be a hereafter. Tell me, would these requests be unreasonable? For the benefactor of such a company to ask you and I for, I don't think so. And is this a reasonable proposition towards personal and social success? If that's what we all wanted, would that be a reasonable proposition? Essentially, this is the very formula of success in life. Being grateful as a human being and a beneficiary. Being decent, law-abiding, and honest. Stopping to thank, to acknowledge, and worship. Living in harmony with others, with responsibility and dignity. To have consciousness, to have morality, towards our existence in preparation of death. This is the proposition of life. And this is the formula of success. Now you may ask, why is it necessary to recognize or to worship a creator or to know and submit to God at all? I say this to you. How psychologically important is it for an individual, you and I, to know our parents? Well, psychologists will tell you that it's very critical for the human being to know their parents. Even if they were raised as an orphan and they were given everything, all the status, education, and all the benefits of life, that person will still, all of their lives, they will always want to know. Who are their parents? How critical is it for the individual to understand their past and to plan for their future? How important is it for children to show respect, <laughs> to show respect and gratitude for their parents? How many parents would appreciate their children if their children grew up and spit in their faces and disrespected them? and disobeyed them and disregarded all the values that they gave them would they still love their children how important is it and how critical is it for citizens of a country 
to have loyalty and honor for their country. All of you would agree that all of this is necessary. Certainly, human beings would all agree that we are all dependent. And no one is able to create themselves. And no one is able to acquire their basic needs by themselves. Human beings rely upon other human beings just to acquire their basic needs. As a matter of fact, it's come to be known that human beings need other human beings to such an extent that if a human being was given everything but they were put in a room in a big house that they owned sitting on a thousand acres of land with all the things around them that other human beings have but they had no other human beings to talk to do you know what would happen? eventually that person would fall into depression and inevitably that person would go crazy and inevitably that person would die simply because humans need other humans just for social interaction therefore it is quite reasonable to consider the obligation of acknowledging, giving thanks, and worshiping the creator of this universe. How psychologically important is it for you and I to show our gratitude for our benefactor? How important it must be to our overall success and satisfaction in life to add this dimension, gratitude, to our consciousness to help us in our ability to conceptualize our Creator and to be aware of the attributes of that Creator. I want you to reflect upon one of the verses of the sacred scripture of the Qur'an that says, Allahu, Audhu Billahi min shaitan rajim In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful. Just think for a moment and bear with me for a moment. The excursion is almost over. The sacred scripture, the Quran says, Allahu, la ilaha illa huwa al hayyul qayyum. Allah, the Almighty Creator, the Sustainer of the heavens and the earth. There is no other benefactor, there is no other God except He. He is the life giver, the self-sustainer, the eternal and the only absolute. لا تأخذه سنة ولا نوم He requires, that benefactor, that creator requires no rest and nor does that benefactor require any kind of sleep because fatigue does not affect that creator. Everything in the heavens and the earth, whether it is seen, whether it is unseen, subtle, evident, high, low, microscopic in the heavens or the earth, inside or outside. It all belongs to that Creator. مَنْ ذَا الَّذِي يَشْفَعُوا إِنْدَهُ إِلَّا بِإِذْنِي So who is it? Who is it among the creatures? Who is it among the creatures, the men or the jinn or the angels or the animals, 
Who is it that can contend with that benefactor and that creator? Who is it that can achieve anything without his permission? يَعْلَمُ مَا بَيْنَ أَيْدِيهِمْ وَمَا خَلْفَهُمْ He knows what goes in front of them in their lives, their history, and he knows what follows them in their posterity and their history. He knows completely because their lives are within the capsule of his knowledge. وَلَا يُحِيْتُونَ بِشَاءٍ مِّنْ إِلْمِهِ إِلَّا بِمَا شَاءٍ And they will never, the creatures, the human beings with intelligence, they will never be able to snatch or harbor or harness any knowledge from him other than what he allows them to do so. وَاسِيَ كُرْسِيُّ حُسِّ مَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ His throne, His throne, according to His Majesty, extends above the heavens and the earth, above the waters, above the galaxies, outside the realm of time and space. وَلَا يَعُودُهُ هِذْذُهُمَا وَهُوَ الْعَلِيُّ الْعَظِيمُ And he does not suffer any fatigue. Nothing is taken from him. If he gives the whole world what it asks for, it doesn't decrease any of his wealth. And sustaining the heavens and the earth doesn't require any effort because he owns it and he sustains it by his will. And he is Ali al -Azim. He is the high. He is the mighty. He is the powerful. He is the sovereign. He is the owner. He is the ruler. He is the Lord. He is the creator. That's the description of God. So I ask you, do you know anybody else that you can describe that way? You know some nations? You know some tribes? You know some kings, some presidents, some companies, some individuals, your father, your uncle, some heroes? Do you know somebody that has that description? No, you don't. Of course you don't. And a shorter version says, say, he, Allah, the creator, is absolutely one. He whom all depends, while he depends upon none. He begets not. He does not give birth to anyone. Like a woman giving birth or a man making a woman pregnant, he does not beget. He is not in the world giving birth to anyone. And he is not begotten. He did not come out of the womb like the world or a baby or being evolved. He does not beget nor is he begotten, for he is the Lord of the heavens and the earth. And how is he above begetting, being begotten, having sons and daughters and issues? And there is nothing inside the creation, whether small or great, that has any significance or has any similarity unto him according to His Majesty. Dear respected listeners, all of this is for your reflection and all of this is for your inspiration towards adopting an attitude and a mindset that will complement you towards a successful life and an anticipation of death where there will be dignity. Death which is definite, but a death with dignity. Um, let me uh, first respond to this. Um, I'm not sure if your friend is a Muslim, and I doubt if you know, just a moment, I'm not sure 
if he's a Muslim, and if he is, I doubt very much if he knows the Quran very well at all. Because you wouldn't be a judge of that. You couldn't be a judge of that because you don't know the Quran. So by him being your friend and him saying that he knows the Quran very well, he could lead you any direction. But certainly no Muslim having any knowledge of the Quran could say that if Allah or Almighty God wanted a son, he could have one. Because the Quran clearly says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forbids for himself and it is the most heinous thing for a human being to consider that the Almighty has taken to himself a earthly form. For this is not consistent with the Creator. From the point of the Quran that I recited to you, Kul Allahu Ahad, this is the Quran. I'm reciting this for you, not as a necessarily your friend, but as a Muslim. This is what the Quran says in relationship to your question. Say that he, the Creator, is absolutely one. One whom all depends while he depends upon none. He begets not, nor is he begotten. And there is none in the creation that has any similitude to him. This denies uh, several things. One, if he's absolutely one, it doesn't mean the number one. That he is one above the creation and one single God. Not divided, no family, no board of trustees, no advisors, no lawyer, no bookkeeper, no company, no many gods sitting next to him, no mother, no father, no daughter, no son, no relative gods, no many gods, only God, God alone. That's what God has always said. And that's what Jesus said. The greatest commandment is the first of the commandments. Hear ye, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one. And thou shalt have no other gods along with him. And thou shalt not worship anything in the heavens or the earth, or any graven images in the heavens and the earth, or in the sea below. Now, this is what the Quran sets forward as the statement of God. So, let's set your friend aside and his alleged knowledge of the Arabic language or the Quran and let's set aside your familiarity with him and your obvious unfamiliarity with the Quran. No, the Almighty has never said that he has a son or family or daughter. And nor did Jesus Christ say, I am God, worship me, or I am the Son of God in the sense that Jesus is the exclusive Son. Yes, in the Bible, Abraham was called God's Son. Isaiah was called God's Son. David was called God's Son. In fact, we were all as good godly people called the sons and daughters of God, but that is only figuratively. Figuratively. Doesn't mean that God is a father penetrating a woman, giving forward seed and having a son. That's a pagan belief. That's an idolatrous belief. That was the belief of the Romans, and that's why the church adopted that. But no one ever said that, no other prophet ever said that. And blessed be Jesus Christ, and free is he of that kind of blasphemy. So my answer to you, and to your friend who claims that he knows the Quran, is that that could not be so. But we can talk about that a little bit more if you like, okay? The question, how is Islam or Muhammad an extension of Christianity? The prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, answered that himself. He said, I am to the other prophets what the cornerstone is to a building when it is, when it is completed. What is the cornerstone to a building when it is completed? It is set in place to signify the completion, the perfection of that building, and that building is prepared for occupation. The 
Messenger of Allah, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what was he to the other prophets? He was the final link in the chain that completed the set of pearls of prophethood. So the prophethood began with the first man and the first prophet, Adam. So all those prophets came forward from Almighty God, calling the people towards God, calling the people towards good actions, coming to the people in their time, in their language, ordering the people in the same way, O oh my people, obey Almighty God and worship only Almighty God and do good actions. That's what Abraham said, that's what Noah said, that's what Moses said, that's what David said, that's what Solomon said, that's what John the Baptist said, that's what Jesus Christ said, that's what Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, said. And also, Jesus Christ prophesied Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. And Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he confirmed Jesus Christ. The Quran confirms the life of all those prophets and all their messages. And in fact, in the Quran, there's a chapter which is called Mary, dedicated to the mother of Jesus Christ. Confirming for us Muslims the birth of Jesus Christ without a father. Confirming for us the miracles of Jesus Christ by the power given to him by Almighty God. Confirming that Jesus Christ was in fact the Messiah and that he was the word of Almighty God. That God put words in his mouth and God gave him power. But Jesus never said, I am God, worship me. So our position is that we love Jesus maybe more than those who claim to worship him. Because we know Jesus as a man as a prophet, as a messenger of God. It's not my conscience, it's that I want to learn more and have more knowledge. So do not make any mistakes after I revert. Should I wait or revert now? Now! <laughs> no, honestly, brothers and sisters, anything that is good for your life Anything that is good for your life, <coughs> critical for your life, don't procrastinate. Don't take the luxury of thinking that there will be tomorrow. Babies die, young people die, pretty people die, ugly people die. Don't take the luxury of changing your heart. If you thought that you were headed north and you had went a hundred miles and you found out that you were headed south, would you go a couple more miles? No, you wouldn't. Because you already know that even when you turn around right there, you're already 200 miles out of the way. The hundred miles you went wrong and the hundred miles coming back. Is it right? And if I had some money for you, if it was announced to you that you had won a prize, and you were asked, would you like to have that prize now or, or later on? What would you say? If you're smart, you'd say right now. So my answer to you, in all honesty and sincerity, is that if you want to change your heart, and you want to change your mind, and you want to change your orientation, and you want to come back to your natural disposition of serving the Creator. Do it now. And when I say do it now, you don't have to come up here in front of the people. That's not necessary. But before we leave this place tonight, we will facilitate that for you, inshallah. Put that sheet right there. Another question. says, I am a Christian lady sitting in the audience and I'm interested in becoming a Muslim, but I'm still not sure. Should I become a Muslim? What advice would you ha give me? I say that if you are a lady loving Jesus Christ and you already have the inclination to be a Muslim, I understand the doubts. Because even if I went swimming, and the water was very beautiful. 
I would still put my toe, you know what I mean, kind of like in test the water. It's always advised that before you get up on the 20 foot high diving board, before you bounce up in the air and look down and see there's no water in the pool, <laughs> make sure where you're diving. So that Christian lady, I would say this to you, before you leave here tonight, we also will sit with you to answer some things that will clear up and open up the way to make it easy for you to embrace the values that you are inclined to. Another question says, why does Allah refer to himself as we rather than them or me or, or I can't see the word. Anyway, what I understand from this is that the person wants to know that if God is one, if Allah is one, why does he refer to himself in the Quran as we? Well, let me give you this here very clear reference. In the Arabic language, there is something called ismu adham. Ismu adham. It means a very powerful name. There's nothing like it in English. So when Allah says in the Quran, Nahnu, it doesn't mean here plurality. It's a way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala expressing Himself in His power, in His majesty, with His attributes, in such a way that it is conclusive that there is no one other than Him. It's called Ismu Adam. It doesn't mean we. It doesn't mean plurality. It's like the sovereign of a country speaking about his royalty, his power, and he says, and we have ordained. The king really means he has ordained. He's using we as a way of adding power to his speech. So the creator in speaking to us in the Arabic language, uses this ismu adam to add power to his presence when he speaks to us. But it doesn't mean we or us in the sense of the English language of plurality. Of course, those of you who don't speak Arabic, you'll have to trust me for that interpretation. Another question says that Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad are messengers of Allah. Then why Jewish can't still follow Moses or Christians can't follow Jesus? Well, the fact that Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad are messengers of Allah has nothing to do with the inability of those who are supposed to follow their paths not to do so properly. The fact that you or I don't represent good citizenship doesn't alter and doesn't necessarily take away from and doesn't disengage or disqualify the authenticity of this government. The message, the scripture, the system of life that Moses, Jesus and Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon all of them, that they represented was from the Creator, the Most High. Now those Muslims or those people of the Jewish faith or those Christians that fail to personify that faith and are unable to respect one another, this itself is not an aspersion upon that faith and no conflict upon that faith. The aspersion or the conflict is upon those who make the claim of following that faith. The question. When we are born, is our life set out? As everything in faith? I don't quite, quite understand the question, but I'll think that what I understand is that the person wants to know is that when we're born, is matters of faith already determined for us? We have something in Arabic called fitra. Fitra. Say that. Say fitra. Fitra. In Arabic, the word fitra means natural disposition. It means that when a child is born, 
That child has a natural disposition. It is already oriented to feel the warmth of the mother's body. It is already oriented to look for the nipple of the mother's breast. It is already oriented to submit. It is already oriented to depend. It is innocent. It is born into the world with a natural disposition of submission and dependence. That is the way God has created that child. All of us, said the Prophet wasallam. he says that all of us were born with a natural disposition to surrender and submit ourselves towards our Creator. None of us were born rebellious to God. None of us were born rejecting God as none of us were born rejecting our parents and none of us were born rebellious to our parents. No, all of us were born in submission. But it's our environment. It's our parents. It's our education. It's our culture that made us into a idol worshiper, a people worshiper, a self worshiper, or an atheist or a communist, or an animal. But our natural disposition as human beings is that we were born in submission and that we were given all the faculties of hearing, seeing, feeling, all the faculties that will allow us to become what? Dignified human beings, recognizing and worshiping our Creator. The matters of faith is simply a road map, and we were given that road map. The question here says, abortion, wouldn't it be better for the, for the mental and emotional help of the mother in cases of rape or divorce if the mother had an abortion than raise a fatherless child? Well, we, we should probably ask the murdered child whether they would have preferred to live or whether they would have preferred to be killed simply because they were the child of incest or they were the child of rape. Now that's a moral question and I'll say to you that yes, it has some validity. Even in the Muslims, there is some, some concern about the raped woman. There is some concern about the child of incest. There is some concern about that. But that happens to be what we consider an exception. Only one out of every 7,000 abortions comes about because of the fact of rape or incest. The other 6,999 abortions come about by choice because people can't stand to live with the choices that they made. And since they don't want any evidence of the choices that they made, they kill it. And as long as they can't see that little fetus that's cut up into 20 little parts, as long as they can't see that little fetus that's put into this vat this hot vat full of acid, long as they can't see it, long as it's thrown away, long as they can forget about it, they just kill it and keep moving. No, we say that's unethical. And we say that sophisticated murder is still murder. And killing little people is the same as killing big people. Murder is murder. And what makes it worse is that those that are murdered are innocent. That's our position. We Muslims, we are pro-life. We make no excuse about it. Another question says, well, that's answered already. If there is one God with infinite mercy and goodness, do we need someone to suffer for our sins. In the Quran there is a verse that says, لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسأها لها ما كسبت وعليها ما كسبت. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the creator of the heavens and earth, He does not cause any one of us to bear the burden of another person. 
to suffer the sin of another person. And it's ludicrous, absurd, and blasphemous for us to continue saying something about Jesus Christ which we have no right to say. How could it be that every child is born in sin? Now just think about this for a minute. Just think about it. How could every child be born in sin but Jesus Christ already died for the sins of the world? Now is that double jeopardy or what? How could Jesus Christ have died and suffered on the cross for the whole world, which he did not? But then again, every child is born in sin. So if every child is born in sin, then Christ could not have died, suffered on the cross for all the sins of the world. Now either Jesus is put into double jeopardy, or the child is put into double jeopardy, or both. That would not express justice on the part of God. No, that's a lie. That's another one of those pagan principles. Has nothing to do with Jesus. Has nothing to do with the innocent child. Every child is born innocent. A child of God. Child coming into the world with no sins. Carrying no sins of anyone. And not adopting any sins until they reach the age of responsibility. That's the Islamic concept of life, and that's the Islamic concept of responsibility. Every soul takes the consequence of their own actions, and every soul will bear the consequence of their own actions when they meet God. A father will not be called accountable for his son, and a mother will not be accountable for her daughter, and no one will be accountable for the other, but everyone will carry the weight of their own souls. Now, that is the justice of God. But I still consider myself to be a new Muslim because my parents, my siblings were not Muslims. I was born into Christianity. But I think that it was along with the guidance, the selection, the opportunity, the gift from Almighty God, a determination that was made long before I was born a gift and a privilege to become a Muslim. But I always had, as a young person, I always had an attachment to the church. As a matter of fact, many churches. I often tell my little story that as a young person, I found myself farmed out into foster homes. And um, no fault of my mother's. I mean, I was not an orphan, but this is the way the system works, the social service system. When mothers have some difficulties with children, the social service system takes those children, farms them out, and everybody makes money. So I was farmed out into four or five or six different foster homes. So by the time that I was 15 years old, I had been a Protestant. Episcopalian, Methodist, Baptist, Pentecostal. And by the time I got to the military service, I even took a little taste at Catholicism. So by the time I was 17 years old, I had the whole rainbow of Christianity. That was also a gift. Because at least in all that confusion, still God was always in my life. And although I didn't live necessarily such a godly life, God was always in my life. And so when the opportunity came for me to review the beauty of Islam at the, at when I was 18 years old, it was so clear, so evident, just like it was yesterday, like I'm sitting there in front of you, that my choice was just like that. And that's why I can say to these two individuals who mentioned to me, don't procrastinate, follow your heart. Your heart will never lie to you. A person says, I recently reverted at your last lecture, alhamdulillah. And three days ago, I'm happy to say that I put on the hijab that is the covering for the Muslim woman, mashallah.
The sister continues to say, in my heart, I feel as though it is right. But on the other hand, I feel as though I should be doing the basics first. No, sister, protect yourself. Distinguish yourself. Meet the challenge of the hijab. Maintain the dignity, the uniform, the signature of the Muslim woman. Don't have any doubts about it. Everything in life that is valuable is put under cover. Our cash, our CDs, our gold, our silver, our jewels are all put in safe deposit boxes and undercover. And our Muslim women, our mothers, our daughters, our wives, our sisters, they're worth more to us, to us than gold and silver and CDs and stocks and bonds. Preserve yourself with the dignity of the hijab and don't let any doubts from the outside come to you. And you will learn, perform your worship and learn the Quran while you are adapting and preserving your morality and your dignity. May Allah bless you and guide your sister for that, inshallah. The question is, uh, is there really a big difference between the Western Hemisphere and the Eastern, or is it just modernism and traditionalism? Well, those are terminologies that are somewhat um, uh, steeped in intellectualism. So let me see if I can break it down to the common person. When I speak of the Western Hemisphere, I'm really talking about Western civilization, the effects of it, wherever it is. Now, we Muslims, we are not anti-modern. No, we want to be modern. We want to be up to date. We want all the sophisticated things that make life complementary. All the benefits, whether it's education, social services, transportation, technology. We want everything that goes along with what's called being modern. In fact, the Quran teaches us to be up to date, to be aware, to be educated, to be in tune. So we Muslims, with our knowledge and attachment to the Quran and to the behavior of the Prophet ﷺ, we do not have a problem in embracing what is considered to be the modern benefits of humanity. But we don't have to be Western to be modern, because to be Western means to be, in many cases, rebellious towards God and family. To be Western, in many cases, means to be oblivious even to the rights of children. To be Western, in many cases, means to have everything for myself and damn everybody else. To be Western, in many cases, means to be imperialistic, to go throughout the world with a puffed up chest, like we own everything, we rule everything, we should have everything, and we are the rulers of the world. No, we don't have to be Western to be modern. And yes, we are, as Muslims, trying to preserve our traditions. It's a matter of putting everything in context. I'm an American, but I'm a Muslim first. I'm an American citizen, honoring my citizenship, being grateful to God and also to country for the privileges that I have as being an American. But I'm first a Muslim. And I've taken advantage of the modern institution of education. And I may be one of the only one in my family that has a college education. That's because the privilege was offered to me. The exposure was given to me. And I thank that and I appreciate that. So we don't reject the compliments of modernism, but we don't have to be to swallow 
We don't have to swallow the whole chicken along with the bones. We don't have to do that. So we want to separate the idea of Westernism, or for that matter, Easternism. Islam is neither East, Islam is neither West, but Islam is submission unto Almighty God and taking the best of what the world has and using it within the context of what Almighty God has ordered us to do. Can you clean up the supposed suppression of women in Islam as an ideology as it stands in the way of many proper people's um, exposure or to Islam. Let, let me just say this, that I invite every person, I invite every woman here, every non-Muslim woman here, to stand to the side when we leave here and talk to a Muslim lady. I mean now, let's not, let's not, let's not ask Barbara Walters about how Muslim women feel. You know, let's, let's not ask Tom Brokaw how Muslim women feel. Let, let's not ask CNN, ABC, Fox. Let's not ask the, the London Times or the Australian Times. Let's not ask non-Muslims about how Muslim women feel, how they live, what are their principles, what are their challenges. If you want to be fair, ask a Muslim woman. Ask my wife. Ask my mother. You see? Ask a Muslim woman that knows her religion, who has a relationship with her creator, who is stable in her society, understanding her responsibilities, her relationships, ask her. And after that, I think you should be fair, that you don't need to ask someone else. But the problem is, no one really wants to ask Muslim women. We want to take pictures of women in Afghanistan, and pictures of women in Palestine, and pictures of women in Pakistan, and pictures of women over here. And we want to listen to what people say about female circumcision, as if Muslims has got women, thousand, ten, thirty thousand, forty thousand 40,000 Muslim women all over the world is being circumcised. Some crazy Steven Spielberg stuff. And let me give you a statistic that you should know about. If you take a, if you take a quota in this room right here, I'll tell you this. Most every Muslim woman in this room will be a college graduate or is a college graduate or is very intelligent and very much socially endowed. And within her family structure, we find that women control the wealth more so than men. Now, what does that say to you? Now, where you find, where you find women oppressed, women exploited, women mistreated among Muslims, that is because those Muslims themselves are not representing the principles of the religion. And in every religion you've got black sheep. But then again, you can't tell me that the 148,000 prostitutes that walk the streets in the UK or the 76,000 prostitutes that walk the streets of Holland that have licenses to do so, you can't tell me that all these little young, naked little girls walking around Australia with no clothes on, you can't tell me that they represent liberation. You can't tell me that the 2,350 
abortions, murders that take place with these young women. You can't tell me that that represents sophistication. You can't tell me that that represents liberation. You can't tell me that a naked woman sitting on a chocolate bar, a naked woman selling everything, toothpaste, everything, you can't tell me that doesn't represent exploitation. So let's put things in context. Let's talk about things correctly and let's be fair and let's be objective. We can talk about that a little bit more if you want to. And let me give you one more statistic. One more. Prostitution, venereal disease, abortion, and pedophilia. And this horrendous number of children being raped and kidnapped that exists in the Western world, it is almost unheard of in the Muslim world. So I think that the statistics kind of like speak for themselves. Um, please give me some proofs from your former status of Christianity that Jesus was not God reincarnated. Well, I don't think that I need to give it from my previous status as a Christian, but I think that in my delivery tonight, I gave the characteristics, the attributes of Almighty God. And there was nothing that suggested from the speech of Jesus Christ himself that he was either God, man God, or God incarnate, because the whole idea of God incarnate was a Greek concept, a Roman concept, a pagan concept, and has nothing to do with Jesus Christ. Why do you say that uh, the church says that God impregnated a woman? That is not what the church believes. Well, to be honest with you, uh, what the church believes and what the church says, they said 354 years after Jesus Christ. So I don't think that 354 years after Jesus Christ, whatever the church came up with at the Council of Ephesus or the Council of Nicaea, I don't think it holds any legitimacy when we connect it to the 19 statements that I could quote to you about who Jesus said that he is. Excuse me? Well, why don't you read it for us? Just read it for us. I'm sorry about this, but no, no, hey, sorry, I, I, just, okay. uh, uh, I said, why do you say that the church says that God impregnated a woman, and the word I'm saying is impregnated, that is not what Christians, the church believes. Christians believe that Mary, as a virgin, not impregnated by anyone, therefore, Mary, as a virgin, empowered by God, gave birth to Jesus. I'm not talking about whether Jesus is God or anything else like that. What I'm talking about is, why do you make the application that Mary was, why do you say that Christians say Mary was impregnated by God when we say something different? All I'm asking you is to represent Christians and their beliefs fairly. Now, if you've done it out of not knowing, I don't mind. But Christians don't believe that God impregnated Mary. They believe that God empowered Mary to give birth to a child. Which is, I think, what you believe. You don't. Be don't, don't ask me what I believe. No, I'll just it's, state it's, your question, yeah. and then I'm going to answer you. What okay. I'd like you to do is, you might have a little follow-up. So why don't you sit right there while I answer? Okay. <laughs> now, since you opened up this can of worms, yeah. 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 we're going to talk about it. Okay. Now, the. The concept that the church does say about Mary is that Mary is the mother of God. Yes. Yes. And as such, they also believe that Mary is also the daughter of God. In another sense, yes. In another sense. And also that Jesus, I mean that Mary, 
that she is also the immaculate. That is, what does immaculate mean? Without sin. Without sin. That means like a human being that is perfect. Yes. Good. So as the mother of God, she's the mother of God, that is the mother of Jesus. And she's also the daughter of God because Jesus is also God. Now, I'll, 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 look, I want a chance to answer all this right now. Just, yes? Wait, just a moment. I'm answering. Well, answering the question. Uh, yeah, okay. Mm. Now, I never said that the church said that Mary was impregnated by God. I didn't say that. You used the word impregnated. Well, well, but that's not what I said. You used the word impregnated. Well, let me just cl clarify for you mm. that. It is not my understanding as a Christian, previously a Christian, that your belief is that God impregnated Mary. No, what we say, what we understand, which is a different understanding that you have, is that Mary was impregnated by the Word of God. That the Word of God was placed inside Mary and she became pregnant. Okay? Now, now what, now what we have, what we have a problem with, Reverend, what we have a problem with is this paganistic concept that God has a mother and God got a daughter. Now that means God is locked in on both sides by Mary. God is, Mary is God's mother on one hand, and then she's God's daughter on the other hand. Now that's a problem with anybody. Now that seems to be some incestuous relationship there. Can, can I but, respond now? Can I respond? Well, listen, let, let me say this to you. If you were sort of like, um, if you were sort of ir ir irritated by me, by your thinking that I said that Mary is impregnated by God, I take that away. And so, uh, so you, you have that. Mm -hmm. But you yourself said to everybody here that Mary is considered to be the mother of God and also the daughter of God. We say we reject that. Now, you can rent your own hall and give your own speech, and then I'll ask questions to you at another time. Uh, can, I, can I just say, okay. Because there's more questions okay, here. Yeah, all that is, I simply wanted you to clear the allegation that okay. God impregnated Mary, okay. you have done that, and okay. I would agree that Thank the you. question about how Mary's mother is got another time. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, we, we want to thank, um, we want to thank our friend, and, uh, and no aspersion meant to the Catholic Church at all, just a matter of concepts. Thank you very much. We ask the Lord to bless and to guide all of the people, especially those non-Muslims that came out here and listened to our lecture. For those who wish to meet with me afterwards, I think there's some special provision to do so. May Allah bless and guide everyone. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Peace be upon those who follow the guidance. Did you know that suicide is among the three leading causes of death in the Western developed world? I said the Western developed world where the semblance and the trappings of success are the most preeminent. So it really means that after all this time and the people walk away from that grave, it's over. What about that person in the grave? What's happening? Because you know and I know that death is almost like sleeping. But that's the only theologically and historically adequate position with respect to Jesus to recognize him uh, not only as a prophet, although certainly that, but as himself, the divine Son of God. And I'll argue that a failure within Islam to recognize Jesus as the divine Son of God has significant consequences for Muslim faith and practice.
and you show us, please, the historical evidence of a tampering or forgery that was so massive that the entire Christian world was duped without question. Because in the past, throughout church history, we've always had controversies. We've had people who have denied certain parts of the scriptures, and they are historically recorded. Marcion in the second century denied the Old Testament as a Christian, and certain parts of the New Testament. There was a controversy, people opposed him, writings were written, argument, debate back and forth. Yet we find no such historical evidence or manuscript evidence of forgeries. From the church fathers, from the councils that were held in Nicaea, whether in the 4th century or the 5th century, or is it taken from the mouth of Jesus Christ himself? And this is what we want to discuss. We believe that Mary is the mother of Jesus Christ, an immaculate woman, a pure woman, but not a woman who herself was God, nor venerated to be worshipped, nor giving birth to a God-man, man-God, three gods, or someone to be worshipped but that she gave birth as God ordered her to do so, and that Jesus' birth was like the birth of Adam, only it was less complicated. Adam had no father, no mother. At least Jesus had a mother. <laughs> If the Imam goes into the store down the street and the Muslim is selling haram, the Imam says, what you doing, brothers? SubhanAllah. This is khanzir you're selling. This is alcohol you're selling. This is maysub, gambling that you're doing. You're facilitating for wahish. What you're doing, brothers? Why are you standing on the corner selling drugs? What are you doing? They tell him, if you don't get out of here, we'll shoot you too. <laughs> and for our young people that are in the streets, we don't like you to be in the streets. We don't like who you are with in the streets. We don't like what you are doing in the streets. We don't like what it does to the image of Islam. But we love you. We love you. You are the sons of Islam and the daughters of Islam and the future of Islam. And inshallah ta'ala, among you, there is an Abu Dhar and there is a Khalid ibn Walid. <laughs> The miracle of the Qur'an is that there is no question a human being can ask about life. Any aspect of life, but the Qur'an has given the answer. Not only has the Qur'an given an answer, but the Qur'an has directed us towards an example that illustrates for us that example, that, that answer. <laughs> Ryan, at this point now, my advice for you is that what you should continue to do is you should move on from that 13, 15 year old experience to the experience where you are right now and understand that there's a whole nother stage. There's no ceiling on this issue. Esau didn't bring no ceiling. He brought a ticket. And the Holy Spirit that you're talking about, that was Gabriel. So we're not followers of Gabriel, we're followers of that next prophet that also Jibreel came to and brought that scripture. You should read the Qur'an, you should read the life of the prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, and not be afraid of it. Okay, and by doing so you may find out that the natural progression of where you are right now is Islam. That's just my advice to you. <laughs> off the shelf and look at it not for its content look at the quality the crispness look at the advancement look at the graphics look at the color listen to the sound superior trash and for the Muslims go to the bookstores and see what is available there inferior treasure so the kufar, they are making the investment to make trash superior. But the Muslims, they're not making any investment to make the treasure better than the trash. I'm <laughs>